All right, so let me get to this story by uh, the Daily News op-ed. <clears throat> Not signed by anybody. Anything that might convince the precious insufferables who have taken over Wall Street that they have had enough of exercising their First Amendment rights to the inconvenience of tens of thousands of people who actually have to work for a living. This bunch ought to get down on their knees and thanks that America's capitalist founding fathers saw it fit to pr uh, protect the privileges. The privileges. It's not a right anymore. Remember, it was all about the Constitution yesterday, but today it's a privilege of the dumb and obnoxious along with everyone else. If the NYPD has made any tactical error in this episode, it was being too tolerant. Police also closed major intersection to traffic, forcing pedestrians to take the long way around. Further, and this is horrible, this is going to... Folks, if you have children, again, please cover their ears. Further, the cops cordoned off the statute of the Wall Street Bull, depriving tourists of up-close and personal inspections. <laughs> For those who want an up-close... Are you effing kidding me? <laughs> For those who want an up-close look at the bull's balls, I'm sorry, you're going to have to defer Give to another day. Give me a break day. here. Unbelievable. Amid arrest, that senior officer was photographed applying, applying pepper spray in a video that is being held up as evidence of a human rights violation, worthy of a trial at the International Criminal Court. It is, in, it is conceivable that he could have kept his spray holstered. Then again, he was surrounded by chaos. No, in fact, he was not surrounded by chaos because there was a huge orange netting between him and all the protesters. And by all the protesters, I mean those half dozen women that were corralled. The right to free speech comes with responsibilities. It does not encompass a right to do just whatever you want, whenever you want, as these juveniles may one day learn. Now, Glenn Greenwald has a great piece on what's behind the scorn for these protests. He said, it's the nature of protests that take place outside of approved channels, an inevitable byproduct of disruptive dissent. Those who are most vested in safeguarding and legitimizing establishment prerogatives which by definition includes establishment media outlets, are going to be hostile to those challenges. As the virtually universal disdain in these same circles for WikiLeaks, and before that the Iraq war protests de demonstrated, the more effectively, effectively adversarial it is, the more establishment hostility it's going to provoke. Much of most of the scornful criticism have come from Democratic partisans who, like the politicians to whom they devote their fealty, feign populist opposition to Wall Street for political gain. A significant aspect of this progressive disdain is grounded in the belief that the only valid form of political activism is support for Democratic Party candidates and a corresponding desire to undermine anything to dis that distracts from that goal. Indeed, the loyalists of both parties have an interest in marginalizing anything that might serve as a vehicle for activism outside the fealty to one of two parties. I can tell you, the best instrument, in my estimation, to get the Democratic Party to do anything, or I should say one of, I think there's value in taking over local Democratic Party apparatus. But I also think protests like this are extraordinarily helpful. The very idea that one can effectively battle Wall Street's corruption and control by working for the Democratic Party is absurd on its face. And I think that's a fairly valid point. I'm not sure it's mutually exclusive. But certainly if you exclusively work on behalf of the Democratic Party, as the only means in which to deal with the uh, corruption that emanates from Wall Street, I think you're going to be out of luck. Much of this progressive criticism consists of relatively, ostensibly well-intentioned, tactical and organizational critiques of the protest. There wasn't a clear, unified message. It lacked a coherent media strategy. The neo-hippie participants were too off-putting to middle America. The resulting police brutality overwhelmed the message, et cetera, et cetera. That's the high-minded form from which most progressive scorn for the protests took. It's just not professionally organized or effective. Some of these critiques are ludicrous. Does anyone really not know what the basic message of the protest? 
I think it's fairly self-evident. Again, it's called Occupy Wall Street, not Occupy Central Park, not Occupy the Natural Museum of History, not Occupy Union Station, I guess which would be in D.C. or Worcester, Massachusetts. Dismissing these incipient protests because they lack a fully developed, sophisticated professionalization is akin to pronouncing a three-year-old child worthless because he can't read Schopenhauer. I even think that analogy is wrong. I actually think there is value in just the fact that they are exemplifying that there is anger. Anger that is so deep that people are willing to... You put their physical well-being in peril. Sleeping out on the streets. Risking pepper spray. Or dislocated shoulders. Or a beating from a cop. Or getting arrested. Or quitting their jobs or cutting back on their freelance work. What that shows, and what the message is, is that there is commitment to the anger. And the idea that they are not professionally organized should be, in fact, a value added, as the corporatists would say, to their protests. They are not funded by the Koch brothers, the AFP. They're not funded by these large institutional organizations. In fact, it's only today. And last night, uh, some of the protesters went and joined a protest by the postal workers. We've talked about what's going on with the post office on this program in the past. But I believe today there is now local union support that's showing up and perhaps some national unions showing up. They are drawing people to them, despite the fact that they don't have a sophisticated, although it is certainly becoming more sophisticated, media center that is feeding stories to the media. It's a great piece. You should go on to, uh, to read the whole thing. But it's clear that we see both scorn from the professional media managers on the left, scorn from the establishment media in general, and certainly more intimidation tactics uh, to cause a certain amount of pain for those people who are willing to do this. Naomi Klein posts a letter, an open letter from Arun Gupta. He is the um, editor of The Independent. She says, if I were in New York, she's braced in, uh, she's in uh, Canada, I would certainly be spending time at the Wall Street occupation. I urge those of you who live in the area to go in person to Liberty Park and check it out. Keep in mind any attempt to create a genuinely open space to share political ideas is necessarily going to be chaotic and at times embarrassing. Yes. Yes, there are people down there who are uh, dressed funny or playing drums or at least, you know, I'm a very conservative dresser. If it's not checked, if there's not a uh, check pattern, Nine times out of ten, I won't wear it. Even when I go on, even when I go on uh, some of these, um, you know, uh, news shows, I get, "Wow, you dress like a like a Republican." I, don't know, I just I grew up in Worcester. I, you know, it, there was one place where you know I bought my uh, clothes. That was it. You know, shacks, I think it was called. But she writes, but Gupta's point is a crucial one. This is not the time to be looking for ways to dismiss a nascent movement against the power of capital, but to do the opposite, to find ways to embrace it, support it, and help it grow to its enormous potential. With so much at stake, cynicism is a luxury we simply cannot afford. And believe me, I am a 
cynical guy. But Gupta goes on to write, to be fair, the scene in Liberty Plaza seems messy and chaotic, but it's also a laboratory of possibility, and that's the beauty of democracy. As opposed to our monoculture world, where political uh, life is flipping a lever every four years, social life is being a consumer and economic life is being a timid cog, the Wall Street occupation is creating a polyculture of ideas, expression, and art. Yet while many people support the occupation, they hesitate to fully join in and are quick to offer criticism. It's clear that the biggest obstacles to building a powerful movement are not the police or capital. It's our own cynicism and despair. Hey, look, do I think it would help if every person down there was wearing a sport coat and a collared shirt and a tie? Yeah, probably. But I also think that if someone was inclined to wear that, they would be much less inclined to sleep out every night. Because, hey, you'd ruined it uh, after a couple of days and it would look like crap. Uh, but, B, that's just not the way people roll. From my perspective, I'm a clean for gene guy. That's why I dress like I do when I go on. Part of it is also probably just sort of my performance art background. I want to fuck with people's expectations. I am much more conscious of the average person having done, uh, been an actor and a performer for years of being sensitive to audience preconception. And frankly, I don't care. Look at the way I dress. It's not a mode of self-expression for me. My mode of self-expression is actually to go on and talk for an hour and a half every day and to get into other outlets to talk. Not everybody has those faculties. I barely have those faculties. But I have a healthy dose of uh, denial to the extent that I have limitations in that respect. So, yes, it would be wonderful if everybody down there um, dressed like, uh, like Tucker Carlson and walked around and, um, but the same reasons why many of those people don't is the same reason why it exists. It's very easy to be cynical about it. It's much harder to find those elements down there that impress you that you can relate to, uh, that can inspire you. And, and that's the reason basically why I went down there was to offer a bunch of different voices, some of whom may make sense to you, some of them won't. But hopefully one or two or three or four or more of those people will have said something that will resonate with you and will inspire you to go out, whether it's in Boston or Chicago or L.A., or whether you live in New York, or whether you do it in some fashion online, whether you pass on a video, whether you make a defense of these people to uh, your friends, but it will in some way get you involved in it. Because I can assure you, if it grows, the benefits will also grow exponentially. They may or may not be there in three weeks, uh, in three months, in three years. Nothing could directly come out of this except for a greater awareness that there is a sense of injustice, except for the next movement that comes out of it. You know, I've used this analogy before. Air America could not have existed but for a crazy person. But it also very well may have sealed its fate that it was founded by a, a crazy person who was a con man. But many good things came out of Air America. 